I'm Ryan Jeffrey, and this is the Passionate About OSS podcast. The purpose of this podcast is to shine a light on the brilliant minds of the OSS and telco industry, to describe a little about their background, but also to share in their knowledge, tips, and techniques. Today, we'll take a look at building an OSS for operation centers, especially next generation situational awareness platforms. Today's guest has a deep affinity for operation centers in telcos. He's refined his craft in this specialized area for around 15 years. And despite working at large telcos, he has a strong entrepreneurial, perhaps intrapreneurial tendencies, but has always taken a really hands-on involvement in building the product. Having a hands-on operational involvement ensures that he's always has a focus on building solutions that make things easier, more consistent, and more predictable for operations teams. He's been in a tech strategy role, which I call Skunk Works, now for over seven years, which must be one of the coolest roles in OSS. I'm delighted to have him on the episode because he's a brilliant forward thinker. Each time I think I have a fantastic new idea, I find out he's already been working on it for over six months. So welcome to David Nestic. G'day. David and I first met around seven to eight years ago when David was already deeply entrenched in operation support at MBN. I've actually forgotten how we first met. Was it in relation to an early podcast that maybe you provided some feedback on? Do you recall? Actually, I think I recall we had a mutual connection through someone else and you had organized this uh, breakfast lunch, OSS breakfast lunch for ah, yeah, yeah. people in Melbourne. And um, I think we came to know each other through through that network. Yeah, yeah. I think you're exactly right. Yeah. All right. So your network and networking and OSS journey goes back much further than that seven to eight years ago. Prior to MBN, you'd already cut your teeth at a telco applications role in Telstra, and that was starting nearly 15 years ago. What did that role entail? Uh, that's right. So... I joined Telstra back in uh, 2004, so I started in um, in Big Pond, and it was quite an interesting time because we had uh, 3G in preparation of a massive rollout for the Com Games, and this is where Telstra were starting to uh, encroach on the content provider space. And uh, one of our major launches was the uh, Commonwealth Games that were here in Australia to do live streaming of sporting events. So that was probably sort of the advent of, of content streaming in Australia. So no other, no other provider had really gone down that path at that point in time. Oh, that would have been fascinating times. I guess you learned a stack during that period. It was, I mean, it was different to, you know, Big Pond known back then as the largest RSP was a ADSL provider and, you know, ADSL2 was coming out. And then, you know, we had the actual Big Pond website had affiliations with AFL, NRL, V8 Supercars, Big Pond Movies. And, and so they were trying to become this all-encompassing content provider and, and merging networks and next generation networks at the time with 3G uh, to get those those um, content out to out to their customers. So it was quite quite an exciting time. And quite an evolution in, in the time that I was at Telstra. Yeah, yeah, and would have been some of the most exciting content going around too. All that, that sort of sporting content is massive here in Australia. Well, you know, it's quite interesting because that, that was pre-smartphone. So, mm. you know, it was it was perhaps a big risk to, to take to push content through mobile devices. And I remember, you know, having a Nokia that had a, a, a colour LCD screen that... Uh, you know, it was quite pixelated and granular, but yeah, yeah, yeah. to to start watching, um, you know, live streaming through through that medium was was a novelty for a lot of people. And when the smartphones came along, that was just a game changer. But yeah, it was, it was quite a an ambitious foresight back yeah, then. Absolutely, no, that's brilliant. Before that, you'd studied applied physics and aviation. It's a pretty big pivot into telco. What, <laughs> what led to that? Yeah, I, I did applied physics, and and that was a it was quite interesting. Applied physics is more about the application of theoretical physics as opposed to learning just the theory. It's interesting, you know. People think, wow, that's such a 
such a deviation from the telco industry. But if we think about communications, the, the fundamentals of communications are all driven by physics anyway. You know, field waves, lights, electrical. Mm. It's all it's all there. You know, all I'll, the way back to Shannon's theory. Yeah, basically. So, you know, for me when when I sort of entered the the telco industry, it wasn't foreign in that I had coding backgrounds. We had to build our own little mini networks to to run some of the equipment and the like. So I wouldn't say it was a natural step, but understanding actually how how the network actually works at, at the fundamentals is probably was one of my biggest advantage. But that even between physics and and moving into the telco industry, yeah, I did the the aviation degree. I had an ambition to become a pilot. And yeah, I wasn't quite sure when I finished my physics degree what what I still wanted to do. So that's why I went into aviation. And um yeah, I was struggling to be a, a commercial pilot for quite some time, delivering pizzas just to just to fuel my my uh, aviation habit and get the hours up. Get the hours up, and then um, you know, the circumstances due to ANSET collapse in Australia saturated the market with uh, with uh, pilots, and September 11 happened you know, mm-hmm. virtually around the same time, and and so I sort of bit the bullet and. And said, I, I need to do something else, otherwise <laughs> I can't mm. be delivering pizzas for the rest of my life just to, <laughs> just to get some hours. So, uh, and that's yeah, that's how I sort of happened into into the telco industry. Yeah, and no, I guess in the, the last year or so, it's uh, probably a lucky lucky one to avoid. It would have been uh, fifteen years of, uh, of fantastic flying at the moment. I think the industry a little bit decimated. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's 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 always a volatile industry. You know, mm-hmm. it only takes a if you if you remember the MH17 and I think what was the other Malaysian Airlines that disappeared. Mm-hmm. You know, they always have an impact on a company, but but you know, it's an essential need for for the world to be able to travel. It'll mm-hmm. always bounce back, but yeah, it is quite a volatile industry. Mm-hmm. And to return a little bit to, to OSS and Telco, what sort of tools were you using at Telstra back in 2005? Do you remember? Were they OSS-style tools or more of the uh, the content delivery? Oh, it was a, it was a com- combination of both. So we had, uh, from an OSS tools perspective, you know, you had your, your traditional sort of uh, remedies or ITAM. ITAM was the Telstra version of that. Uh, we had... Uh, HP OpenView, so USM, there was some net call in there, you know, f- right back down to some of the, you know, s- uh, switches that, that we were using for, uh, for the big pod network. A lot of that at the time, you know, very Telstra specific, Telstra design, jump hosts and, and the likes to, to connect into the network. I can throw out a whole lot of acronyms, but are probably going to be meaningless to, to people. There are a number of different uh, product names. There was a BPCM, which was the Big Pond Content Network. There was RDN, which was their routing IP core sort of part of the network. EDN, which was their their management network. You know, and then you had sort of the Metro Ethernet. In between there, they had their you know very specific transit network for SDH and PDH. Access networks were were predominantly back then Alcatel Lucent type DSLAM devices. So. Mm. Uh, and then, of course, you had the uh, the HFC network, which was part owned by Foxtel and and uh, Telstra. And so Telstra was the true first multi technology me- in uh, company in Australia. So so it was um, quite a quite a diverse and broad uh, experience. And then they had Velocity, which was their version of a, a you know fiber to the premise, but that was a very very small um, market share. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And multi-technology mix, it's probably a good segue. You then moved across to MBN in 2010. Yep. Uh, given that MBN only formed in mid to late 2009, you must have been one of the really earliest employees there. Yeah, so I think um, I think my employee number was 92. <laughs> so <laughs> I was one of the um, very first people to, to join. You know, walking from a, a large enterprise, Telco, into... A single floor, uh, which housed the entire company. We didn't even have desktops or laptops at the time, and we were mapping out what what MBN would look like on brown paper, posted on meeting room walls, and drawing up processes. And 
you know, using ETOM and ITIL as a, as a framework. So that was everything done from scratch and passing post-it notes as forms of communication between desks. <laughs> so it was such an exciting time. I don't think you'd get to experience anything like that. And it's a true, true startup with uh, capital that, that's backed by the government and the world was your oyster and how you'd be able to design what that would look like. So that, that was a really good experience to have. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, exactly as you said, a startup doing one of Australia's biggest infrastructure projects uh, would have been fascinating. So you inherited uh, some networks and um, also some network management platforms along with it. It must have been really, really exciting to be designing and building operational tools for such an important infrastructure project for Australia. Oh, it definitely was. I mean, the first service from memory launched in uh, 2011. And, um, you know, at the time, we had to start with the, the fulfillment stack to be able to even provision an order. And, and it actually wasn't until we had these major type releases that, that would occur. And they were quite, uh, there was quite a significant period of time before, before each release. So the first release was about the fulfillment system. Mm. And, you know, that was, that was to basically build a, a service logically across a physical network. And we're talking about back then there were uh, fiber to the premise type services. Mm -hmm. So we had, um, you know, we had Alcatel, SAM, which is the service access manager, which manages the aggregation network. And we had the access network being built out as a, you know, GPON fiber OLT, which was also another Alcatel product. And that was managed by, by AMS. And then, you know, having to build that logical service across that plus integrated into a transport domain. So in the early days, you know, we hadn't built out any form of DWDM network. So we were using sort of uh, many service providers to provide that backhaul link. And, you know, they were quite ar archaic systems at the time to, to stitch all that together to create, mm -hmm. a, create a logical service. And then, and then the release after that were the assurance tools. So... That's when, um, at the time when the, when those first services were, were going live and the ops guys were, were monitoring those services, they were doing that native out of the EMSs. Uh, so, you know, they'd be swivel chairing between different <laughs> element management systems just to look at the alarms that, that were coming through and no intelligence whatsoever and no filtering. So, okay, when you've only got maybe half a dozen services and... <laughs> And uh, as, as scale grew, you know, there was no way that the guys would be able to uh, manage directly out of the native system. So, so the next big sort of OSS release was Netcall to go over the top of that, uh, which was an alarm aggregator. And, and it, it allowed the uh, knock guys to have a, a single pane of glass to, to view what was going on as more of the network was starting to be built out and we were starting to build our own backhaul and, and transport fibers so there are additional EMSs that were coming in into play yeah and then and then from that point on and beyond that was we needed to have some sort of a ITSM capability so BMC remedy came along change management at the time was managed through a through a spreadsheet that I developed as a template you know there was nothing from an incident management perspective to to record keep uh, an incident idea and there was no concept of problem management at the time so mm -hmm. uh, you know fortunately that ITSM suite sort of pulled all that together. Yeah absolutely the real fundamental building blocks isn't it so yeah I hadn't realized that it was those fundamental building blocks I thought with the uh, the networks you'd inherited that some of that would have already existed but really interesting that it was the EMS level and oh, quite quite raw I mean you, you have to appreciate you know, some of the, the BSS systems that go around to, to support the OSS systems also need mm. to be put in place. You don't, you don't, you, you inherit the technology of the network, but you don't inherit the processes and mm. it comes along with it. So all of that had to be, had to be built from ground up. Yeah, so true. And how much of what you learned at Telstra was applicable to that brave new world? Uh, it, was, it was significantly different. What was interesting mm. was um, the people that, that started to join NBN in the early days were, were either Optus or Telstra. You know, you're either in the Optus camp or you're in the, in the Telstra camp. And 
uh, you could say that the the Telstra people were were heavily engineering focused. There was mm. more of the engineering was coming out there, and then the operations guys were more more sort of optic centric at the time. And that that has since dissipated and mm. sort of coming from all sorts of backgrounds. But in the early days, it was very distinct between the the two camps. Mm. But what was good was the fact that people were bringing different ideas on how they did it at mm. one company versus another, but everybody was still in, in that sort of mindset that, well, we don't have to do what they did. We have an opportunity here to start from a blank canvas. And, and it was kind of being, bringing the best of both worlds and, and mm. seeing what worked and, and trying to establish our own identity. So. Yeah, absolutely. And you gravitated particularly towards network assurance. Um, so it's critical for that to be done right so that it stands up under highly pressurized situations. Do you have any hints for us on how to pressure test that, particularly for someone who's building one up from uh, from scratch? Yeah. I, so, you know, one of my, my sort of key focuses was um, what we called operational acceptance. So you know, we, we spent a, a great deal of effort in setting the operational standards up front and defining and designing what best in class was for operations right at the get-go. And so every time, you know, the engineering guys would or the architecture team would, would start to push something through, it would have to go through this operational readiness checklist. Mm. Right? And if you didn't tick those boxes, then you weren't allowed to launch. Whether it was not necessarily, well, it was even at the product set, but whether it was at a, a new system or whether it was, was a new product offering, because we did we did only start with one traffic class that mm. had had expanded the traffic classes. So so we 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 apply that template over and over again. Mm. And that, and that would still be applied today too, wouldn't it? It still runs today. Yeah, it's 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 a fundamental piece of uh, how operations work, and and mm. of course, you know, some of the challenges were that we had to build this thing fast, and you know, you you compromise at some point where to get to the speed of market versus what the operations guys need. There was a there was a level of compromise, and and mm. you you know you you'd capture that, and you'd capture that as a as a risk and. And try to mitigate that after the fact, but we had that process in place to to continuously improve. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. What springs to mind when I think about network assurance is the the futuristic Rolls Royce situational awareness video that you shared with me a few years ago. It was on YouTube, but it seems to have been pulled, so I, I can't share in the the show notes. But what was so important about that video? Maybe you can describe a little bit about what was in it and why it was so important that you were uh, showing different people that, that video? Well, that, that, that video resonated with me. You know, it was, this is where perhaps my, my days as a pilot was, um, mm. was heavily influenced or by this, this video that effectively it looks as the future operations center as a, as a cockpit of flying an airplane, right? Mm. Uh, the concept of, of an aircraft having a glass cockpit of information that's easily representable, is dynamic and changes mm. uh, depending on the situation and that the person piloting the craft is acting upon what that information is telling them. If you think about the magnitudes of telemetry data, an aircraft has times that by tenfold in a, in a telco network. Mm the concept should should still hold true. So the idea that you you get an alert out of the network, there's some automation that occurs in the back end that does that diagnostics and then comes up with a, a recommended course of action. Still at this point, uh, the human can make the ultimate decision to agree or disagree with that outcome. But in that process, it's already dispatched uh, drone, drones to do this visual inspection because this is about uh, this video specifically was about autonomous uh, shipping, mm. and um, you know one of the ships had had broken down, and you know they were able to dispatch these these drones to do visual inspections to give the operator an indication of what was going on. It was a it was a comms aerial that failed. You know, once all the diagnostics and that had come back, 
the next course of action was to dispatch a little tug to to go and repair the comms radio uh, mm. ditch that was on the on the boat. But for me, that was just how a, how a network operation center should be running. They're like, it, it's a no brainer. It's a natural natural evolution. We've got to get away from you know being reactive and monitoring alarms to respond to an event to then go and do some manual diagnostics to then make a determination to say, oh, well, we should probably do this or we should dispatch a field engineer. That all, that process should all occur. And, uh, and uh, the point of resolution is, is really probably the last step that may need some human intervention in that aspect. Mm. And it's really interesting that you use the analogy of the cockpit as well. So being a non-pilot, when you look at the, the cockpit, there's just dials and levers and everything just seems there's so many different options, so many things that you can press or interact with. And to me, that seems a little bit like an OSS as well, that they are very, there's just lots of buttons, lots of things that you can do with them. But I think what you're describing there is even a much simpler user experience and user interface as well. But perhaps when you are a pilot or when you are a knock operator, you know exactly what all those clusters are for and how to really quickly get efficient outcomes as a result from them. That's right. But the idea of, you know, being represented information in a dynamic form mm. rather than a static display of a screen, you know, flashing up different colours of different alert severities or whatnot, mm. it, it needs to have more context in, in behind that. And so, you know, the Rolls-Royce video would, would provide on a single screen, uh, a summary of mm. what happened. And that was all that the operator needed to be aware of to understand what the next course of action was. I think sometimes we overcomplicate things to make them look aesthetically pleasing, but they're mm. not necessarily adding value to the process. And, mm. you know, that's why less is more in, in some aspects. And, and the situational awareness is, is actually a military terminology mm. <laughs> uh, I, on a combat field. Mm. And so these guys have obviously mastered the art of that. And there's probably a lot of trade secrets about how they visualize a battlefield, but that's a, effectively what it is. It's, a, it's, it's the ability to be able to look at the environmentals around your bits of infrastructure and, and then being able to make decisions from that. Yeah, I've always looked at the same sort of thing, that we should be looking more towards the battlefield type environments because there is so much going on that's all uh, interacting with each other and it is so dynamic that uh, I've always been intrigued but never been in one of those uh, military roles to see the kind of command and control software that they use but always thought that that's probably where we should be looking that because there is so much happening in a, in a telco network, how do we give the, the next best action yeah. And, and I mean, I guess that's, that's the desire that there's probably still a lot of learning that needs to go in behind that. Mm. Um, you know, there's no panacea of one tool does everything. It's, you know, it's mm. never going to happen. In the early days of thinking when we would have been perhaps a, if we were to be a, a straight fiber network, then mm you probably have a good chance of being able to do that. But as, uh, you know, as time went on and, and we introduced other access technologies that obviously complicated the situation because now not only are we dealing with we're a two vendor uh, single network provider to multiple vendors, multiple network technologies, multiple vendor type equipment arrangement and the complexity just grew and grew and, mm. you know, each each technology type does things a little bit differently to the other and trying to abstract all that information into a, a common sort of framework and view was becoming more increasingly difficult. Mm. So that's probably a good time to, to introduce us to a little bit about MBN. So what is the scope that they cover? What is the size? We've touched on the multi-technology mix, but um, perhaps you can give a, an explanation of what it is that you're trying to manage the size and scope. Hmm. Yeah, so so present we we manage just got to count this correctly. I think so. Rather than counting, I'll tell you the different access technologies. There's fiber to the premise, so that's fiber straight to to the person's home or business. 
there is uh, fiber to the curb, which is getting fiber up and utilizing sort of the, the last bit of copper to, to the premise. It's known as a, as a DPU. So it's effectively a, a VDSL connection, but with a, a short copper run. Almost uh, like a DSLAM right there on the on the property boundary and just a, a copper lead in. Basically, yeah. You know, it doesn't service more than, you know, I think the biggest we, we would get is about eight. Mm. Um, but typically they service four, four premises. So mm. I consider it like a micro micro D slam mm. and then there's fiber to to the node where people were traditionally connecting off a off a pillar there's a D slam uh right next to that pillar and fiber runs up to that so you know you'd get copper runs of you know anywhere between 50 meters to maybe up to eight nine hundred meters uh then we've got fixed wireless which is predominantly targeting now our rural customers where it doesn't make logical sense to, to uh, run a fiber connection to at this point in time, and then satellite for even more remote areas of Australia. So and and HFC, HFC as well. Yeah, don't forget the, the HFC network. So that um, contributes to a large percentage of the access technologies between that and, and fiber to the node. They're probably the two biggest currently mm. where we're over 8 million premises connected around the country. And then, of course, we've got our our aggregation network and our and our DWDM network. It's a broader state to to really try and cover network assurance, on, isn't it? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. I mean, in the early days, we thought you know we could we could contain it to a, a small knock size, but as you add more complexity, that grew, and and uh, now you know we're trying to focus on on how we simplify that with what we have and and of course there's a future technology roadmap that the uh, SDN and NFV worlds are, are emerging and MBN are probably trying to understand how sort of plays in in a wholesale network provider so that's the mm. key difference as well we're we're a wholesale provider as opposed to a, a retail provider of telco services so we, we've got to be mindful of our demarcation of you know, we provide the access, but we don't necessarily provide the content over the top of that, that mm. the retail service providers do. Mm. But the end customers still see it as an MBN service. So there's That's also right. the, that second layer of customer expectations that you have to serve with a probably a gap in visibility to an extent of where it travels through the RSP or the retail service provider network. Well, that, that's exactly right. I mean, you can do so much more diagnostics at, at a layer three, but we, we only work at a, a layer two level. So trying to understand that customer experience at a layer two is near impossible without having to add some additional things on top like probes and mm. and um, other types of technologies that, that can tend to simulate what the, what's the customer experience is. But mm. each retail service provider has their own network connecting into our network and, and mm. then we don't have visibility of that. So from an end-to-end -end value chain, there is a point of demarcation that, that we just don't have any visibility of. Mm. And I guess from that complexity, that's where your current role has really been born from. So what does op the, your op strategy role really entail? Well, it's, it's really, at the moment, it's looking at how we can, although they're not emergent technologies these days, they've been around for a while, but, but how do we take advantage of the data that we do have uh, and apply sort of, you know, AI and ML across the top of that to see if we can get better insights into what's happening into the network. Uh, so, you know, I've been sort of heavily focused on that area, ultimately, trying to get to the point where we can use those insights from those technologies to drive better automations as well. Mm. People talk about closed loop assurance and intent-based automation. And mm. th there's probably different meanings for different people of, of what that is. Uh, and trying to get away from the idea that it's just business process driven automation that drives efficiencies. It's not necessarily just that. Mm. It's, it's the fact that you got to get it to a state where the network is almost self-healing or self-aware of what it's doing and taking corrective actions before it even hits a, a network engineer. Mm. That's all, ultimately where we want to try to get to. But you can't you can't do it in a big bang approach. You you have limitations around 
the data that you have, the network technology is probably not at a level in some places to be able to support that. So you've got to work with what you've got. Mm. Build it in such a way that it's agnostic to the technology type. Mm. And, and that when the network technology catches up at some point, you know, you can reapply the same fundamentals to achieve that. And then, you know, I'll probably make reference to one of the things that, that we were doing with Netcall was the um, Netcall Operational Insights and where we we're applying sort of that AI ML over the top of alarms to be able mm. to correlate patterns of events cross the main and, uh, and group them in, in some sort of meaningful fashion. That way that would reduce the, the amount of noise that an operator would be presented because there was sufficient amount of knowledge now that we had that we could say that definitively that we could say that these group of events are related to this root cause. And, and you know, that, that has been quite a successful program over the last two years. And, and there's still more work to do in that space. But once, once you get to a point where you're never going to say you're going to get a one-to-one -one relationship, but for, for a single event to an action mm. is, is where you want to get to. But even if you can get to sort of a three-to-one event, so for every, every one real event that's effectively correlated, you may have two events. It's, it's still driving so much efficiency in that monitoring space that you can have a degree of confidence that you can start to shift uh, the demographic of the network engineer away from just monitoring and focus more on complex incident management. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately, when you've got enough automation in place that you start to move away from just incident management and mm -hmm. focus more on that deeper problem management. And then mm -hmm. not only that, you empower the engineers to be able to close that loop again and start to build in their own automations and their mm -hmm. own efficiencies into the network. Traditionally, it's always been engineering, do the design, do the config, hand it over to operations and operations, just manage it. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, we're probably now getting to a point where operations are starting to do their own development into the network to, to mm -hmm. gain further efficiencies out of the network. Mm. To really automate away the, the volume and allow them more time to, to perhaps focus on the complex that you talked about. That's right. But, you know, let's just say, for example, it may not, and this comes from the site reliability engineer concept that um, that Google developed, you know, how, how did those hyperscalers get to the point in size that they did managing squillions amounts of data and, mm -hmm. you know, they, they started to transition their operations guys away from that and started to focus on that DevOps concept in, in real time. And I think that's just the natural evolution that a network engineer is going to go is start to do their own DevOps, Dev for Ops, with the intent to streamline the network as best as possible. But, you know, for that to happen, they've got to have the right tools in place to be able to do that. You can't expect a, a person, a traditional coder, to have that network background mm. and, and vice versa. Yeah, you, yeah. You're going to have to have a blended workforce that, people that understand virtual environments and people that understand networking principles coming together and, you know, coming up with their own solutions in that respect. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And have you really looked closely to the hyperscalers for what that next generation network or network next generation operation center really looks like? We have, um, you know, we have had a pleasure of meeting who's now the CTO of of Juniper, Bikash Kohli, who was basically the guy who who invented the site reliability engineer concept. And his words of wisdom is it took them 10 years, is, mm. is what he said. It just didn't happen overnight. It was it was something that took a while for it for it to evolve. But what he was saying was that the people that he had, and, and this is probably key to any success in, in this space, is there are only about 30% that were buying into this idea that ops took another step in, in their function to drive that automation back into the network. Mm. And if it wasn't for that small early adopters, then the others would never have followed suit. You mm. know, the, the mentality that I got schooled in this and this is my job and this is what mm. I do. That change management aspect is, is the hardest bit. Mm -hmm. And people who have been managing 
networks for, you know, some of these people have probably been in an operations center for 30 years. Mm -hmm. The rate of change of what even 10 years ago an operations center looks like to what it, what it is today and what it will be in the future is significantly different. And for the younger people that are coming through, for them to, to see a whole different career journey to what they, they're probably taught in, in university. Mm. of where where the industry is going you know and and we're in that we're probably in that phase now we've got a small group of people that are that are really excited about the prospects of where it could go um and then and then of course you're going to have the people that are like oh yeah this is sort of black magic to me i don't understand Mm -hmm. but i would say they're, they're apprehensive but also at the same time i think people are starting to understand now that their jobs have to change in some way or another and you know when we are talking about sort of those ml solutions that right now or well not even right now but even only t- two years ago machine learning and that was was the role or or the art of a data scientist it's, mm. it's, it's no longer the case it's mm. it's been democratized you know, it is it's um you know you got to have you got to have the domain expertise in mm. order to get the right outcomes if you if you look at a at a problem and you and you you build a hypothesis around this this problem then you start to apply sort of the machine learning across that hypothesis say so, mm. well if this happens maybe this is an outcome of it and then you run it and it either succeeds or it doesn't succeed and you and you try again and then, and then that's where this problem management aspect of of a person's role starts to come into play it's it's not black and white it doesn't mm work or it doesn't not work it's it's a lot of gray in between and and you have to really think about how 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 you're going to get the outcome that you're you're going after mm. and but then uh, making it repeatable not just and a, then, a correct, correct and then and you know this is probably one of the things that i've been working on in in the anomaly just dis- detection space that we want to get to a point where we want to start to understand things going wrong in the network that aren't necessarily driven by a, a single event trigger of any mm. description. It, it's it's looking at different metrics, which in the past you'd never put together mm. to create a correlation between. So, you know, we'd look at signal to noise ratio in the HFC network with mm. cable modem dropouts, with throughput statistics on the CMTS and, mm. and, traditional performance management application that you'd get, you, you tend to look at this data in, in serial. You mm. go and look at your throughput, then you go and look at your, your drop packets, and then you go and look at this. And and then it, the human's brain needs to go and connect all the dots. And it's mm. the moment you get beyond two data points of different metrics or, or telemetry, that's it. There's no interest in an operator having to go and do that le- next level of investigation. Well, it's also a time factor. So you're getting a firehose of information. You can't go and oh, I'll just go and check another 15 metrics and, and see if there's any correlation, but also not being able to see patterns over time. No, it's just not really feasible for a human to do that. It, it's not. And this concept of anomaly detection where we're running thousands and thousands of metrics in, in parallel and then... Mm having the ability to tune the sensitivity of that by a basic slider that altered the algorithm the network engineer didn't have to have any data science knowledge Mm. in behind him he he would know that if i change this sensitivity to this and this one to this this is the impact they'd see it in Mm. real time because it would replay back over historical telemetry and then they they would go you know what, this is probably an acceptable threshold of event triggers mm. that I can actually take an action on. And I can then also sit down and try to understand what is what is the correlation telling me? Mm. You know, is it a precursor to a critical event? Is it a critical event that is starting to see traffic degradation over time? No one's being informed about it. You haven't got customers at, at a point where they're concerned about it, that they're raising faults with their RSPs. Mm. They're getting to identify these behaviours or these signatures before they become a systemic problem. Mm. Yeah, really, really interesting. And 
you talked, if we look back a little bit on, um, on the, the Google scenario where 30% bought in, do you feel like, that to me seems like the, the intersect of the Venn diagram of the, the network people and the software people is probably down at maybe 3 out of 10 people in operations would have both sets of skills. Do you feel like that's a reflection of the industry that uh, we have come from separate backgrounds and now that Venn diagram is overlapping more and more and more across networking and coding with the ability to push back into what will increasingly become more software driven networks as well? Yeah, I, look, I, I think it's the technology that will drive the change in the behavior ultimately. There are people, there are a minority that have done a bit of that crossover. But yeah, ultimately, you know, it'll be probably a decade before we see a real shift in that paradigm from mm. sort of software-driven network engineers to just your traditional bare metal box switches, routers, and, and do a little bit of config to to an entirely different concept of, of virtualized machines so, and virtualized networks. So yeah, that, that'll in, inherently happen. I think, again, we're unique in that we are still a wholesale provider and, and we are still only providing layer two pipes and and the application of, of an SDN in our world is still very much being defined as to what that, that means. You know, for, for a layer three provider, it's all about the different types of products that they can offer. For us, it's probably more about how do we enable those RSPs on our network to have greater autonomy and build their own product sets over the top of our network. So still a lot to learn in that space. And and as time goes on, that'll probably be core part of the curriculum and and people Mm. to come out of, you know, education with those backgrounds and that that understanding and knowledge. Mm. And do you think uh, that our whole organization structure, the whole concept of ITSM actually needs to change to be able to accommodate this. Are we trying to retrofit the new way into old structures that aren't necessarily relevant? Or do you feel like it is the natural extension to level one, two, three, four and um, the ITSM type processes? No, I, I, I most certainly think there needs to be a fundamental change in that space. Mm. Um, you know, the, the traditional sort of concept of incident change, problem management. It doesn't fit, does it? Is no, it inherently way? establishes its, its silos. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and, it becomes a ticket flicking thing. Correct. Uh, you, you, when you're talking about SDN type networks and the network is dynamically changing on the fly, you've got to start to think, well, how do you, how do you capture that? How do you capture that state of change? and do it in such a way that, you know, if something does break, that you have an audit trail back into what has occurred because it won't be human driven. It'll be, mm. you know, it'll be automated. And and although, you know, you, you'll have maybe syslogs that'll tell you these states of change, you still do not want to go back to, you know, to the config or to, to, to the syslogs to interrogate what, what's occurring you have to have that in some sort of real-time fashion that mm. easily traceable mm. uh and and you know the traditional itsm systems i don't think work in that space anymore mm. they become yeah. less relevant anyway yeah, yeah and interesting that you talk about syslogs too because i assume that it's in some of the the warning messages, the information messages that we probably have traditionally turned off, that you actually start to see some of the predictive nature of uh, these AI machine learning tools being able to say, well, this warning message that you've got now will becomes a problem in six hours from now or something like that, whereas traditionally we've probably just turned them off. Would that be a fair assessment? Well, yeah, that, that will most definitely be a fair assessment. I mean, when, when you start to get data in, in a string format then um rather than having to go to a file to, mm, to figure that it. Stuff yeah, up, yeah you, you you start to get it on demand and and that's where we should be starting to look at how we drive the network through that uh as opposed to waiting for after the fact and 
And yeah, definitely applies to syslogs, it applies to all forms of telemetry, whether it's environmental temperature, whether it's, you know, even IoT devices that might be out there that, that we start to bring all this back and use it in such a way that builds a picture of what's going on. Mm. And it puts you or, or people like you around the industry, it seems to put you in a, a really interesting position because on one side of it, you've got the, the knock operators want to fast the horse, which is incremental <clears throat> improvements, which allows them to retain their jobs. But then you've kind of got the, the execs who are wanting a better, cheaper mode of transport, which is more of the automation and less headcount. That must be a really tough thing for the whole of industry to, to kind of juggle with as well. I, it's it's definitely a, a, a challenge and it probably all does come back to, especially in the automation space, it, it, whether it's driven by a human wanting to take action or an exec wanting to get operational efficiencies, at the end of the day, it all comes back down to the data. Mm. And, and if you haven't got, data that's in a timely fashion, acceptable level of data quality that you've, you've got to accept that there's always going to be some data quality issue, but we're finding, you know, that you can still get things done. Mm. As long as you understand the gaps, you can still mm. get things done. And, and if it's coming to you at a frequency that, and a granularity that's, mm. that's right, then all of a sudden you can start to drive insight. So you can start to drive decision-making around that data. Mm. And then even coming back to the ITSM suite, you know, traditionally people have, have used that as a, a means to record actions, mm. but they're not of any significant detail that you can use. Well, or reliability, I assume, because we've got human intervention yeah. doing pick lists and so forth. That exactly will right. take the easiest one of the pick list. Well, you get one guy that'll do it one way and you mm. get another one doing it another way. Uh, and then, yes. It's it all, destroys your machine learning. It does. It's all very well and good to say that you can optimize that and the machine learning will, will pick out the best one. And mm. it's not necessarily, not necessarily the case. So, you know, where we should be getting to is being able to drive sort of why are we typing on a keyboard to, to input information in, uh, a ticketing system when mm. we should be having microphones on these operators talking into like a Google Assistant or an mm. Alexa, for instance, uh, and capturing that action in real time, which is going to be far more accurate, probably far more detailed about what's happening. Mm. Uh, and, and all of a sudden we could be driving the network through voice commands as well. Mm. So, and then I guess the natural language interpretation of that as well. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so, so there's still plenty, plenty of scope for us, us to move, but yeah, it, it ultimately does come back to the fact that you're only as good as the data that is provided to you in order for mm. you to drive an action out of it. And, 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 you know, you've got to, you've got to target those areas, you know, where you can succeed and, and, and it is, it's incremental improvement. And, and as, as I mentioned earlier, as other parts of the network start to mature and, and change the protocols that for the network to talk to the mm. systems start to get standardized things will will become much easier into the future mm. so it's interesting that you talk about incremental there too because I, I really feel like what you've talked about crosses yes there's an element of incremental to what you're doing but it seems like there's a fair bit of exponential and even quantum change type thinking in the way that you're approaching this yeah look there there, there is there is definitely in the way we approach a solution you know from a problem there is probably especially in I'd say the last 18 months that there's been some quantum leaps in that respect mm. and the challenge though, for that to feel like a significant operational efficiency, it it has to be embedded in the process somehow. Mm. So, you know, what we do, we build these, I'm not going to call them point solutions because when we go into designing the solutions, we do always go into how the reusability of it, right? How mm. here's a use case, we'll solve for that use case, but also make sure we design it in such a way that when the next use case comes along, mm. we're not re-engineering the product. 
But because you're doing it in such a way, you've got pockets of, say, next generation capability, and you've still got a ton of legacy that you're managing. So from a, a network engineer perspective, there's not a lot of change for them. It's like, oh, that's that's nifty. That's cute. You can do that. I'll use, I'll use one of the ones that we did. We, we were successful in being able to identify when a satellite service would have performance degradation due to rain fade. So we applied, you know, a whole lot of modeling over weather data and, and we're getting to a point where we're probably over 90% confident that we could suggest that at this hour or between these hours, your service may be compromised. You know, you'd have performance degradation due to, due to rain fade. And, and it was, it was great, but what do you do with it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> For us, it's, the network doesn't support the fact that, oh, can we switch the traffic to another beam mm. that may not be impacted? Mm. Uh, typically, the, the bigger the impact is actually the upstream rather than the downstream. But at the moment, we can't, we can't actually achieve that. We can't switch the traffic in, a, in an efficient manner. It takes a lot of effort to be able to, I guess, reprovision those services on, on a different construct so it goes in, on another path. So we know about it. We just can't do anything about it. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And and I guess even um, in terms of your notifications, you have to deal in absolutes. So 90% is pretty impressive, but you may be just interrupting the customer on something that might happen or might not happen. And the, I guess the customer experience, they're not necessarily desiring that. Yeah, so so again, it's, it's about what is the consumer expectation? Do they want to know about a potential problem? Or do they only want to know about definite an so, actual problem? Yeah, yeah. And there's probably two schools of thought around that. Mm. If, if I'm, and then thinking about the demographic, if I'm a, mm -hmm. you know, out in a in a remote area and and I rely on my broadband service to to execute meetings or working remotely, maybe I've got something scheduled at that time. Maybe mm. it'll make me think twice and reschedule to to a more optimal time. That's a nice. That's a nice thing to have. Is it the major expectation of people? Probably not. Is it going to represent well from a customer experience perspective to say that's a really good service that you offer? I, I don't think it's enough to move the needle today. Mm -hmm. and, I and I could see particularly if we've got a lot of potential rain fade, let's say it's um, during the wet season in the north of Australia, then they could be getting just loads and loads and loads of notifications. So I, I guess I can see both sides of the spectrum. Yeah, like you, what you don't want to do is establish the boy who cried wolf. And so yeah, yeah. Then absolutely. people get desensitized to the information, and then and then nothing happens. You know, mm. it just becomes noise. So yeah, there there is a very fine line uh, in that respect. But most mm. definitely, it, it's to be able to do something like that, and to be able to prove that we can do something like this. We'll get put on the shelf and, and get dusted off when we're able to automatically switch traffic around in that space and and then you can take action. But the idea, well, the idea behind the algorithm that was developed for that, because this was actually done in-house, is that it can be re reapplied to to another scenario. Probably the next the next best thing that we can focus on that we can actually do something about. And this is more starting to push into that proactive predictive space is power. Power is a, a telco's worst enemy. Mm -hmm. And um, can we start to predict the failure of batteries that, mm. that in the event that we do lose sort of the mains power, do we have enough situational awareness about the health and state of our batteries that we can t either do nothing because mm. we don't need to, everything's running as it should in terms of of a backup mode or or do we need to take action either before the fact that it fails because we know that that battery discharges at a rate that would cause customer impact or do we sit and wait for a little bit wait for sort of the event horizon mm. to, to hit and then make a decision to say well we're not going to have enough juice the power company is not going to get this mm. back up let's dispatch a generator and so so things like that that are within reach today that we mm. can do uh, and they're the types of things where we can start to drive actions and optimize how we manage that whole mm. sort of power scenario, failure scenario situation. 
And that is a real change in mindset because we have always dealt in the absolutes in reactive mode. There is an outage, there is a failure. Whereas now we're dealing in, I'm assuming that you never get 100% confidence of a prediction, but if you're moving into that predictive world, the proactive world, you're now having to move into the 90% likelies or things like that. Is that how the data is presenting out of these tools that you're developing? It, it is, it is. It's, um, it's not all or nothing. It's, it's, some of it's really good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> some of it's not so good. And, and that's just the nature of data science, right? And that's prediction right. In general, that's right. But this is where you've got a hybrid of processes that, that have to work now. So you've got this sort of automation process where where the predictions are are good enough to mm. take an action from, and and you can initiate that action. And then you've got a prediction that is is maybe between that eighty and ninety percent range. Mm. Where, yeah, maybe nine eight or nine of them out of 10 are real. It's just not enough data is, is there to push it up into that 90% range. And so you still need someone to take an action on that. And that's where it comes into, you know, there's a hybrid mix of supervised machine learning versus mm. just straight off autonomous type actions. And they're the types of processes now that are starting to emerge of how, how we get these people to start to work with this information and then drive that or close that loop feedback loop so that you know you continuously improve but understanding you, you don't want to lose that intellectual property of how to do things today mm. you're still going to need to know how to how you do things today even if they're automated in a fashion there's always going to be a degree of fallout and that's the other thing about how we design the solutions is the automation itself needs to re-represent that information to a human as if a human had executed it themselves so they can then pick up where the automation left off and and easily follow through with the task at hand and then the next evolution of of that network engineer is okay we've saved them time in although the automation only did 60 percent of the task and they had to pick up the work there should be enough time for them to go back and now interrogate and understand why that mm. automation fell out in the first place and then empower them to be able to build the next model mm. yeah remediate it or or design a new a new model for that mm. and it seems like across so many things that you've discussed today we're at that real inflection point of what was done historically to what will likely happen based on the tools that we're seeing what it will look like in the future but we now have that big task of trying to organize change and that's that's obvious, obviously one of the biggest challenges within the OSS industry is how to influence change because often the most te technically perfect solution isn't actually going to work into the future because people push back against it. That's right and then that adoption is the death of many <laughs> product mm, systems. Absolutely. Yeah you know, they go wow great features but I, I don't I don't see value in using, I can do something just as easily my way, so. I can do it in a spreadsheet. I don't need a, a yeah. fancy data science tool. No, exactly right. So, so yeah, I mean, you gotta, you do have to take them on that journey as well. You have to, mm. you have to sort of excite them about what the future looks like and then what does it mean for them? If you don't, if you don't sell it in that way that, there's something in it for you. It may not be today, and today may not seem that impressive, but mm. in the future, these are the art of the possible. These are mm. the things you may be able to do, but in order for us to get there, we need to take it these smaller steps to get there. Yeah, absolutely. So looking around the world, and I know you do a lot of research and really look into the future on this type of stuff, and... The, the Rolls-Royce video is the perfect scenario, perfect example of that. Are there any other telco innovation programs or benchmarks that you look to guide yourself for? Are you looking elsewhere? Are you looking to the Netflix chaos monkey? Are you looking to, you talked about Google earlier on, where is it that you see uh, providing the shining lights for what the next evolution looks like? Yeah, I, I think a lot of my efforts are spent in, in the hyperscalers, the Googles, the Amazons and the likes. There's, there's still plenty to learn. 
from those those companies. But you know, I'm I'm not fixated to to one sort of industry or, or anything for that matter. I'll tell you one industry that significantly impressed me, and I got I got invited to uh, Red Bull Racing Team's Formula One showcase on how they use uh, what's an AI and and um, how they use telemetry data because they they actually have these semi trailers which are their data centers mm. for the race day capturing all of this telemetry information out of out of the vehicle and there they were able to run models to predict how to best what their best race strategy for the day would be mm. and they had IoT sensors on the tracks they had what was coming out of the vehicle itself from the type of resistance that the, the tarmac was giving to mm. the vibrations that the road was generating, temperature, moisture, you name it. They had all of this, this stuff. And, and quite literally, there were two engineers that their, their job for the entire weekend was looking through all of these models to see mm. what the optimal race day strategy should be. And I, mm. and I thought that... That is crazy. Like that is petabytes of data just over a weekend, and yet they they were able to get you know you need to run at, at this acceleration, this fuel consumption at this time on this lap, down to that very level on this corner. You need to be doing that. That's that's how that's how detailed they were in in basically telling the driver how he needs to drive the car, mm. and and that's just phenomenal amount of uh, intelligence already there exists today yeah actually it's interesting that you mentioned red bull because one of my customers uh their chief operation officer came out of uh, the red bull racing team and said why can't we do what the f1 cars do for our networks and mm. said, well uh, for a start i think uh, we're probably getting telemetry every 15 minutes or 30 minutes in their case and um, some of this equipment is decades old, so it's a little bit different than the scenario of F1, but it's certainly something to aspire to. I, I think it is, um, and, and not just that. You know, that's that's the race day, that's the race day action that they were doing. That all that data that they collect during that race period all gets sent back to you know head office, mm -hmm. and there is a whole other group of engineers that are looking and taking a next level of interrogation in that to then go and design next year's race car. That's a practice that I think telcos need to get to is, is yeah, you've got the on the day guys and, and they're quite skilled, but that same skill set should be able to go deeper into that understanding. And then that's ultimately where you get those efficiencies and you, and you drive you know, the, the most optimal network you possibly can into the future. Mm -hmm. And that's where, where I'm talking about. That's the future of problem management. You do that part better and, and your, your event and incident management, in theory, should start to diminish because you're catching it before it really does become a problem or you're finding ways to mitigate it. Mm. Yeah, brilliant. And so we talked a little bit about the inflection point before. Are there any other concepts or anything that you can see into the future that will really flip the telco industry on its head or that we need to flip the telco industry on its head to be able to cope with possible future change? I think we're, we're a long way um, from it. But one of the, the biggest things for a telco industry in terms of an overhead is its field resources. Mm. If the industry was to change what are the emerging technologies like drones and stuff where we can start to, to not rely as heavily on those hands and feet resources and start mm. to do more, things more remotely out in the field, I think that's that's where things really could shift the needle for, for a telco. Mm. I don't think anyone sort of really probably crack that nut yet. You know, there mm. are things that we can see today that, that are obvious in terms of visual inspection of, of towers and, and the likes, but what is it that for all that underground infrastructure that, mm -hmm. that we could be looking at and doing? There's still plenty plenty to explore in that space. And I think that's that would definitely improve the bottom line for, for any telco industry. Mm. 
And how about, and so we talked about that 15 minute telemetry. Obviously to, to get higher quality algorithmic understanding of the network, we have to get much, much higher uh, speed telemetry. But it's a really big difference between, say, one Formula One car versus millions and millions of connections out there in the network. Yeah. How do you think that we we get there? How do we get to millisecond type telemetry, or is that just going to blow up our networks? No, no. I, I you know, it's 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 edge computing. It's distributed networks. It's it's the fact that you know we should be adopting the fact that we're sending this information to the nearest data center rather than trying to traverse all this information back, back to a single EMS. Even, uh, I guess, that concept that you talked about it earlier on, streaming rather than batch processing of the data, how realistic is that or how can we already uh, stream process data at that kind of scale for large networks? Or do we have to still batch it? And therefore, with the whole batch ingestion pipeline, we're implying half an hour before we see any any real action out of uh, a recorded uh, piece of telemetry that we might have, well, we might have recorded. Yeah, I, I think there's still some architectural decisions that probably need to be made to work out how best to do that. The next generation of network equipment are obviously very fo- much focused on that streaming telemetry data as an option, but are are the companies actually geared up to be able to consume that? Now, Mm -hmm. you can send all this this information back to a a data lake and you can do all that analysis after the fact, but where we've got to get to is is how how do we intercept that data stream Mm. with the algorithmic knowledge that we've developed and learned so not necessarily replicating the data, but just applying that intelligence, either at the point of the device or near, as near to. Well, bringing it back to the cockpit that you talked about earlier on. Sure. Yeah, correct. But obviously you don't want to go and re-replicate all that, all that data because it'll be magnitudes greater than, than what we know of today. So there's a bit there to work out for, for a lot of the architectural designs that perhaps we have in place in, in many telcos that being able to consume that amount of data is still a challenge. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And without really revealing anything sensitive about MBN, but just more your personal perspective, are there any particular technologies, products, concepts that we should be already using that you have uh, objectives for in the future or that we should be really playing around with? Yeah, one, one tool that I'm... Um, incredibly impressed with and, and this is uh this comes down to both how it actually does its machine learning to how a user actually interacts with it and it's called anadot and this is this is a you know the proof of concept that we sort of ran on anomaly detection where these guys have managed to build a product that is quite literally agnostic to whatever the metric or the data source is. So, you know, in some examples, they've, they've used this to look for revenue leakage in companies where they post online advertising. And, and if that advertising link has failed, you know, they're able to identify that as an anomaly. And then that company can go, oh, I need to fix my advert link because I'm, I'm losing revenue from mm. it through to being able to do what we do in terms of looking at, you know, three disparately different uh, metrics in the network and, you know, with no real discernible correlation between them, but put together when there's changes in in their behaviour were key indicators to a a bigger problem. And that's called Anadoc. Now, you don't have to select an algorithmic model and then train the model and, you know, do the, the typical processes that you do in, in that respect. It's quite literally plug and play. And then itself in the back end is able to ascertain the best algorithmic lo- logic to apply to that data set. Mm-hmm. And then it has a user interface that basically meant that you did not have to be a data scientist. You mm-hmm. only had to be a, a domain SME in the particular area that you're looking at. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you had half a dozen 
counters and sliders that you could you could modify to your liking until you got a satisfactory outcome that what anomaly indicator was telling you was actually a, a genuine thing to be concerned about from integration of the of the data to actually getting some useful insights the turnaround time was weeks not months and years in some cases that i've seen so mm. and does it then take it from understanding an insight to then helping feed into some sort of corrective action as well uh, it, it it can I, I mean i didn't we never got to that point but um mm. it, it most certainly can you know you could either do the old school and send me an email uh, integrated into say a team's chat channel or generate an snmp trap or all of that could be used as a trigger to a corrective action but you know mm. you can uh, appreciate what what its craft is is about mm. identifying an anomaly that i don't think the products ever have got the intent to go and and do the actual corrective action you'd leave that to another system to do mm. yep, yep. So we're getting towards the end. Um, I know you're a really independent thinker. Would you share some beliefs that appear contrarian to the rest of the industry? You talked about a few about around the inflection points. Is there anything particularly contrarian compared to a lot of the way other telcos do things? <laughs> I'm not sure. I, don't know. I definitely have uh, differences of opinions to how some people uh, approach things, but no, I don't think anything contrary. I think generally the industry is is going down the direction that I'm thinking. You know, I think everybody's got sort of their own journey to take. Uh, there's definitely different approaches. I still different ways to skin the cat. Different ways to skin the cat. I, I still a strong believer that you really need to understand your business and your business processes before you go and start to explore technology mm. as as the solution and there's there's the concept of business process excellence and six sigma mm. and, and yeah you can apply all that jazz to try to get a efficiencies but i think um systematically you can start to solve a lot of that stuff as well mm. the, the concept of uh data mining the the systems that you have today with at a transactional level to start to build out what the process of the organization is. Mm. That gives you a far truer view of what's happening mm. than, you know, some person actually mapping out a process flow and, and then, um, you know, then redesigning uh, from an as is to a to be and saying, mm. this is going to work. I think we can do far better in that space. Mm. If you don't get that bit right, then obviously trying to automate becomes a greater challenge. There's mm. no point automating an inefficient process. Mm. It's a really interesting point too. It's one of the things I've always found to be really interesting is the number of variants we have in our processes. I remember there was one scenario I looked at where there were only three states in a process, but there were 313 different <laughs> variants of how you traverse through the states. Which yeah. doesn't make a lot of sense, except the fact that some were looping back on each other. And that maybe it's really hard to design systems where there's that much complexity or variation, whereas making more of a transitional state decision <coughs> perhaps makes more sense um, well, than real process driven. The thing is, that the assurance domain is an unpredictable yeah. domain. Yeah. And, and, and I guess, you know, maybe a lot of the automation that we know of today was always built around the fulfillment process. Mm. And assurance was always sort of after the fact. Mm. And I think that maybe that's one of the one of the things where I, I think assurance and fulfillment should be a converged mm. process in itself because you think about assurance relies on the inventory, uh, it relies on the logical and the physical aspects of the inventory, how the service construct is made mm. without having that integrated into the assurance process. Because at the end of the day, assurance has one physical inventory system, one logical inventory system. Mm. As 
you know, CMDB maybe over here. And, and then all of a sudden you've got all these different sources of information. You don't know what your source of truth is. People mm. say it's at the EMS. People say it's the fulfillment stack. And then it just adds complexity to the operator. And But if they're designing these fulfillment systems with assurance in mind, then we could mm. simplify that. Well, not only that, I really feel like uh, decision support on fulfillment. So taking what's actually flowing through to assurance. So if a particular process chain is leading to a lot of fallouts or to callbacks on a particular service, so it's been made ready for service, but you keep getting outages, then use decision support to avoid that chain because it's just ending up with a whole lot of rework. Absolutely. Yeah, it goes both ways, right? So if the, if the state of the, the network is in flux and you've got people trying to push through orders in that particular mm. area, well, why isn't there some self-awareness that puts that order on hold and then retries once mm. that incident is, is cleared? And then that should all be autonomous. It shouldn't have to go into somebody's queue uh, then only just to, to reinitiate those mm. orders again. It's just, you, you, you get around all of that stuff. Well, what ends up happening is you build these RPAs that mitigate that effort from mm. a perspective, but the underlying problem never goes away. Mm. You've, just, you've just put a Band-Aid over the top and then it's it's not a problem anymore, but it'll come back to bite you <laughs> mm. eventually. Yeah, yeah. So clearly you love to stay beyond the bleeding edge. How do you do it? What are you, your go-to resources to try and find out next generation oh look people people i'm always keen to look at you know cto universe is a great resource area i do have a lot of conversations with bell labs there's people in juniper that that i think are, are, are great that think a little bit like me you know at t they've got some people over there that we trade ideas on so it's really about those connections to those people that what are you doing? Hey, cool. You know, this is what I'm working on. And, and we learned from, from that. But more recently, you know, I've been working a lot with the energy sector guys to see how we mm. can we can better um work together to to understand how how we can protect our network and also how they can um how they can perhaps utilize us to improve some of their network visibility. Mm. So you learn from everybody. There's no one single single go-to place that I have. It's just listening to people and, and being open to ideas and, and going away and doing some homework about it. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So any other pearls of wisdom to, to leave anyone who's just starting out in network assurance? Expect to fail. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yeah, it, it happens all the time. And, and it's a cliche, but learn from it. If we hadn't failed as many times as we did we wouldn't be where we are today because it forces you to rethink the problem mm -hmm. it forces you to think of there's got to be another way to do this and and that's what drives innovation if you give up at this first sign of failure and don't try to tackle it again then you're not going to get very far mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Especially in something as dynamic, the in the the baseline, the benchmark is is constantly changing. Each additional network node or change in the network config changes everything. So we do have to expect dynamic failure. Yeah. So, so we've covered a fantastic range of really interesting topics. If uh, if people wanted to reach out with you and uh, and continue a conversation, where can they find you, David? Our uh, best place to find me is on LinkedIn. Right. I'll uh, put your uh, connection there to LinkedIn on the, in the show notes. So thank you very much for being a guest. I really, really appreciate it, the amazing insights you've provided today, David. Thanks a lot, Ryan. Nice to have a chat. All right, great. And thanks also to the audience. I look forward to getting another brilliant podcast out to you shortly. Thanks for listening to the Passionate About OSS podcast. You can find more episodes, more than 2,500 blogs, and our contact details over at passionateaboutoss.com.